Hello there, welcome to Impact Stories on AAU TV. AAU TV, the voice of higher education in Africa. My name is Ransom Bekwe, I am the host of the program. Follow this discussion on our social media platforms and on our satellite television. You can also follow us on our dedicated website, tv.aau.org. I am at Ibadan to interview an international higher education icon. Actually, he is an international educationist who always calls himself an educationeer. Before I introduce my guest for this program, let's go for a short break. You may not have heard about us, but we have heard about you. You've been searching for a new kind of university that matches your ambition. Our world-class education is renowned, but there is more to us. Meet the university in Ghana that is transforming Africa. One that is nurturing a new generation of ethical, entrepreneurial leaders. One that offers scholarships thanks to the Massacre Foundation so that you can be part of our community of students who stand for integrity, discipline, and excellence. There is only one such university, only one, where 100% of graduates receive job offers or graduate school admissions. You may not have heard about us, but we have heard about you. You are Africa's future, and we are Ashesi University College. Together, we can begin to create a new Africa. Welcome back, viewers, to Impact Stories on AAU TV. I am here at Ibadan to interview an international educationist. He is widely sought after, has published widely, has almost 300 publications to his credit, and has not even retired at the age of 80. It is my pleasure to introduce Professor Pai Ubanya. He is an emeritus professor at the Faculty of Education, University of Ibadan. Professor Pai Ubanya, welcome to Impact Stories on AAU TV. Thank you very much. I hope I'm going to have an impact. Yes, you always have an impact. Okay, Prof, just give us a little bit about who Professor Pai Ubanya is. Well, he is an ordinary person. Has only one head, not two, as so many voted. I'm um, a Nigerian whose parents come from today's Delta State, but born in uh, just Plateau State and raised in Ibadan, where the university is located. Okay. And that was some 80 years ago. Okay. Prof, I'm going, to, I'm going to raise that. Welcome back, viewers, to Impact Stories on AAU TV. And I am privileged to interview an international educationist well sought after, he has worked widely. There is nowhere in the world that I believe he has not been to. It is my pleasure to introduce Emeritus Professor Pai Ubanya. Please, um, Professor, Ubon Professor Ubanya, welcome to Impact Stories on AAU TV. Thank you very much. I hope we're going to make an impact this time. You want to know about me? I want to know who Pi is. Okay, Pi Pius Augustine E.K. Obanya, born some 80 years ago, precisely 29th May, 1939, in Jos, which is now in Plateau State of Northern Nigeria, okay. but raised in Ibadan, okay. where we are sitting right now, where yeah. I've lived since 1945 consistently, except for a few years out to work in different places. Um, well, I've done all sorts of things, but I've been passionate about teaching. Okay. I started teaching actually 60 years ago, 1959, okay. around the city of Ibadan. Um, okay. I had just come out of what uh, you call uh, secondary modern school, okay. which in old Ghana you call middle school. Middle school. Where I taught for three months then got into the civil service as clerical assistant. Okay. 1961, after all levels, left civil service job to be a teacher again, okay. to teach in the type of middle school I'd attended, okay. and later after A level, to teach at the university level. Okay. Then came into the University of Ibadan in 1964 oh. to study education, English, French, 
Okay, but before you even entered into teaching, what was your passion as a, a young person growing up? As a young person growing up, people called me teacher. That was my nickname. Okay. And then the f a compound in the you know crowded part of Ibadan City, I always had my blackboard. Okay. And I could teach people even things I did not know. Mm. And as I was went about hawking kerosene for my stepmother and so on, people would stop me to say, oh, this problem of simple proportion or compound proportion mm. with a matchstick on sand, I'd be able to explain. Mm. So even when I wasn't teaching, people were asking me, Pai, why don't you go into teaching? Okay. Mm. But then during those days, was teaching the only profession that was attracting the youth? No, it wasn't. It wasn't probably the least attractive. Independence was coming, okay. and the civil service was a strong pool for talents. Okay. Uh, people were even leaving teaching to go into the civil service. Okay. Uh, okay. So if I was a, an ordinary Nigerian, perhaps the civil service could have been my attraction. Mm. But I did leave the civil service okay. to teach, mm. and to teach in the bush. Wow. Yes. Okay, now when you finish your secondary school, you entered the university. Unfortunately, I didn't go to any secondary school or teacher training college. Okay. I had a three-year post-primary mm. in uh, what it was then called in Western Nigeria Secondary Modern School. Okay. And when I came in, I was posted to teach immediately. Mm. Three months later, I passed the civil service entrance examination. Okay. And that brought me into the ministry, mm. the regional secretariat then. Mm. as clerical assistant. It was right. quite prestigious to say you were working in the secretariat. Then. Okay. And then what, what led you to leave and then to go to the university? And then why did you go to study French? I didn't, okay. I, well, going to the university was just continuing my education. Right. And uh, of course, um, you had several choices. Right. My choice was first choice education, second choice education, third choice education. Mm. And French came by accident. Nigeria then was very seriously governed, and it was decided that anybody offering any arts or humanities subject would also add French. Right. So my red letter came, education English French. I, I, I didn't know a word of French. Mm. But when we got into the University of Ibadan, we were following what was known as syllabus B, which was an entirely audiovisual course, mm. starting from ABC. The advantage then that was you acquired an accent that was near French. Right. At the end of that year, out of about a thousand students in that group, the university selected 30 of us to go to Dakar. Right. And we went by a French boat, stopping in every Francophone country, mm. spending six weeks in Dakar, both academic and social contacts. By the end of which you became, you found French as a living language. Mm and you became attracted to that language. Okay, mm -hmm. so and you had your, you had a first class in French? Not in French, in education. In education. With French as a teaching subject, okay. together with a distinction in practice teaching. Okay. And I always boast about that, because I've been waiting since 1968 for anybody to combine first class honors with a distinction in practice teaching. I haven't seen any. Wow. When that arises, I will order a prize. Mm. And you opted to immediately go and do your PhD? No, the university, I was in fact borrowing money to pay my fees. Right. But after the, uh, the first class honors, the university offered me a postgraduate scholarship. Right. And in those days, you were not strictly taught that when you were doing the, uh, the higher degrees, you were almost left on your own. Mm. But you had to be assessed at the end of the first year. Right. I offered to study general linguistics along with those who are doing postgraduate diploma in linguistics just to strengthen myself as somebody studying uh, language education. Mm. So at the end of the first year, the university exempted me from masters. Oh, really? And I had to do a PhD straight. But wow. while I was in the, working with the ling linguistics department in Ibadan, yeah. I got to know CLAD, the son of linguistic applicator Dakar, Okay. I immediately contacted some French contacts and I got a fellowship to be in Dakar 126970 mm. in this Center for Applied Linguistics. Mm. So not only did that make my French, what you call it, smoother, it also allowed me to know linguistics and related disciplines in French mm. and to make wider contacts. 
Your academic progression is very phenomenal because you didn't go to secondary school and you didn't write your master's. Yes. And at the age of about 34, you had your PhD. Yes. That is quite quick. Well, the PhD took some time. I started in 1968. Uh, uh, by 71, I had submitted. Oh. And I really got a job in the University of Lagos as lecturer mm. at step three, that is not even beginning at the beginning. I think it was because I'd started publishing without knowing why people publish. Oh. Up till now, I tell the young ones to publish is easy. You work and you tell the story. Mm -hmm. uh, I was working and probably telling the story. And there were even no journals in Nigeria then, so I published outside. So when I appeared for the interview, I was immediately appointed, not even as assistant lecturer, but lecturer, so step three. Mm. And the impact of that was that Ibano decided I must get a job. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you, you, you lectured at Lago, um, University, University of, of Lagos, 71, 72. Okay. And, and returned to Ibadan 72. Mm. My salary went down two steps. But why? I have not regretted because Ibano doesn't offer you any inducement. Okay. Uh -huh. Now, uh, why did you move from uh, Lagos to Ibano? Because Lagos to me did not appear offer what universities were offering. Mm. In Ibano, every day was some ac academic activity. Right. When I got to Lagos at 5 p.m., I was the only one left on campus. Mm. And people were quarreling over all sort of things, thinking that the PhD would give them a big position. Mm. Well, I believe the PhD was in the end, it's just the beginning. Okay. Uh, so at what point in your um, professional career did you leave the classroom to do administrative work? I wonder if I ever left the classroom. I became a professor in Ibadan in 1979. Okay. The result came in February 1980. Right. That 1980, I became director of the Institute of Education. Mm. Of course, I was also teaching okay. and researching and doing field, a lot of field work. Mm -hmm. Then, 83, I completed my term. 84, I was sought of after by the newly established Lagos State University. Mm -hmm. I became Dean of Education, right. Foundation Dean. But I had to lead by example. Yeah. I was also teaching and researching mm -hmm. and committed mm -hmm. to so many things. Yes. But yeah. UNESCO Breda, at a point, um, UNESCO brother at a point, uh, you know, got you to Dakar, Senegal. I well, think you worked for... The story of Breda started 1978. I found myself by chance at a meeting to start what was called NEDA, Network of Educational Development, Educational Innovation for Development in Africa. I served as a rapporteur. Okay. And the minute I presented my report, I became everybody's darling. Wow. So whenever I appeared. Sure. But it was uh, almost 10 years later when I saw the advertisement for the deputy director okay. of Breda, mm -hmm. who will also be coordinator of that NADA that I helped him found in. Yeah. I was then working with the World Confederation of Teachers. Yeah. I, I applied and I was appointed. Mm. Then how, how long did you serve at um, Breda? Well, I came in 1st of August, 1988. Okay. I was deputy director, what you call D1 in the, in the UN system. Mm. Uh, three years later, uh, the post became vacant, that of director D2. Okay. Again, I applied and I was appointed with a firm from uh, 1991. Okay. Then 1998, I was again told, uh, instead of retiring, May 1999, which was my birthday, mm -hmm. I should wait till December, because the then Director General Federico Mayor, who spoke to me, was leaving at that time. Okay. And not only was I extended, uh, my contract extended, I was also promoted Assistant Director General mm. for the last six months of my career wow. in UNESCO. Wow. So I spent a total of 11 plus years in Dakar. Wow. And, uh, it were, was you, quite were, fruitful. were you publishing whilst working at Dakar? Oh, yes. When I became professor in 79, people shouted that I had 65 publications. 79? Yes, 65. 65. When okay. I became professor, there yeah. were nine contenders, if you like, and I got it. Okay. And I was barely 40 years old, so people were looking for who is this pie. Mm. Mm. But when I was living in 1986 to join the World Confederation, I had 137 publications. When I came wow. back from Breda 1999, I had 200 publications. Today I have 287. So 
I'm publishing. I'm still publishing. You are still yeah. publishing. Yes, because I am still working. So you work. You I tell the story. You, I thought you were in retirement. I'm not retired. Of I'm out of paid employment. It doesn't mean I'm retired. You so don't professors don't retire? Professors may retire, but uh, <laughs> you don't retire from education. You don't retire from education? No way. Even our mothers and grandmothers remain educators. And what is education, if I may ask? Education simply has nothing to do, very little to do with schooling. Okay. Very little to do with your ability to speak English. Mm. Very little to do with your knowing mathematics or mm. physics. Very little to do with your being a PhD or PhZ. But the process, and I mean the process, it's not an event, okay. of identifying and nurturing human talents for that person's self-actualization and for uh, public good. Mm. So, mm. And it is a, not only a lifelong process, but also a life-wide process. Lifelong meaning as you go from one age to another. Life-wide meaning as you encounter more responsibilities, mm. and you adjust to those responsibilities. Mm. Yeah. Viewers, we are talking to Professor Pai Obanya, who is an educationist who sees that he is not retired even at the age of 80. Let's go for a short break, and when we come back, we'll delve more into the life of Professor Obanya. viewers to Impact Stories on AAU TV. I am here at Ibadan and I'm privileged to be interviewing Professor Pai Ubanya, who is an educationist and he says that he doesn't retire. To his credit, Professor has over 280 publications and I'm going to list some of the publications and Professor will speak to them. Professor, here I have a book that is titled Educationeering. And we have been hearing you talking about educationeering. Can you just delve more into what educationeering is about? Okay. As you can see from the cover, it says you, before you judge education, you have politics. The nature of politics determines the nature of the policy and education. And that determines the program. And the program dictates the processes and the processes the product. And it continues. So if you are judging the product, these children are not serious. They are jobless. They are unemployable. You have not gone back to the roots. Uh, but educationeering, the way I interpret it, and I said, there, I say, I'm professor of educationeering. Mm. First, I see all sub-disciplines of education as being interrelated. Okay. And I see education as interrelated with other aspects of human development. So educationary to me has come to mean what I now do, mm. making education happen. Mm. You call me to a university in Botswana, you say we want to become a full-scale university, a university college in five years, how do we do it? I work with your colleagues mm. and we come out with a strategic plan and you implement it. Mm. I get to some place they tell me, like Liberia, they have junior secondary schools, but they would like to have specialized teachers for junior secondary schools. I call the people together, and at the end of two weeks, we have a program called JSSTEP, Junior Secondary School Teacher Education Program, yeah. and they implement. So education hearing has come to mean simply making education happen. Okay. Write books, tell stories, attend seminars, make recommendations, write communiques, but let this be translated into action. Mm. Start doing it, 
and learn from doing. Mm. So, Prof, now we have this book, Dreaming, Living and Doing Education. Mm. We also have Thinking and Making, Thinking and Talking Education. Mm. African Education in the EFA Decade. Mm. Educating for the Knowledge Economy. And I believe this should be the one published by UNESCO Breda, The Dilemma of Education in Africa. Okay. Can you talk specifically about this publication? Okay. <laughs> well, this, uh, first of all, this series has been a way of people, pub really publishers, getting all my thoughts on education into one piece. And the dilemma of education was the first in the series in 1999. Mm. Now we are going into number eight. Okay. Uh -huh. Now, the dilemma of education in the mid-1990s, the Director General of UNESCO then, Federico Mayor, decided to have a priority Africa problem program. Okay. And one arm of it was education. And I was the officer servicing the group. And I had to direct, prepare some papers to direct the discussions. Okay. It was then I wrote the dilemma of education in Africa. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And that became the title page mm. for this collection, okay. which is a collection of 60 papers written during the 11 years I was in UNESCO. 60 papers? Yes, 60 different chapters. It has a wide variety of things. And the dilemma is just... Um, the cover title and the cover page. Uh, if you look at the cover page, you see section one is the overview of ma major issues, mm. which has a dilemma. Okay. Section B is how education reform has taken place in mm. Africa. Section C deals with teacher education. Mm. Section D, curriculum and education materials. Mm. Section E, literacy issues. Section F, higher education and research. Mm. And I can briefly summarize. The dilemma then was that if you were to count numbers since independence, Africa had performed wonders. Mm. But in if, terms of numbers? Yes, but if you are going to quality, efficiency and the rest, Africa is was still below everybody else. Mm. So the call was for what I call meaningful access. Okay. By all means, let's get to school. Let this, but let's go through school, mm. or let's get the school, let the school go through us. Yeah. The section on educational reform, only the key chapter there is going beyond the education reform document. Okay. We assemble people, we come up with recommendations for reform, we keep citing the reform, but we never really undertake the reform. Prof, so do you mean that this, which was written so many years back, mm -hmm. is still relevant in our modern day era? Unfortunately, they are still relevant because governance in Africa has not changed. And no. since everything goes down to politics, okay. politics has not improved. Mm. You may have gone from military coups to civilian government, but civilian government has not translated into people's governance. Mm. And then the section on teacher education is simply saying, is simply saying that we have to return the teacher to the African school. Meaning? Meaning we've, over the years, got in all sorts of people and labeled them as teachers. Okay. During which period, the society has come to look down on teachers. I have a story here of get out of teaching and look for a job. Get out of teaching? And look for a job. Somebody comes to marry your daughter, and you look at him, you say, fantastic, handsome boy, descendants of Alaji Usman Dansoko, Wonderful man. Mm. Then you say, young man, but what do you do for a living? And he says, um, very, you know, shyly, I teach in a Damasiba High School. And you say, ah, oh, okay, my boy. Because of your family background, you'll marry this girl. But mm -hmm. make me a solemn promise. Get out of teaching and look for a job. Does it not go to confirm the old age saying that the, the reward of a teacher is in heaven? No, the reward of a teacher has never been in heaven. We all remember our parents. 
and mm. they are our first teachers. Okay. And we all remember teachers who have made an impact on us. And reward is not only material. Okay. Uh -huh. mm. So I'm saying in that unless we return the dignity of the, the teaching teacher. profession, whatever reform you carry out, there will be no miracles mm. because you cannot rise above the level of your teachers. Okay. And the curriculum and educational materials, mm. that is one way, one area we have tried to do things. But we make the mistake of thinking that curriculum just means an assemblage, an assemblage of subjects to teach. Mm. More, what is more important is the process. Is that what you call the pedagogy? The pedagogy is whatever you do to bring people from the level they are to the level they ought to be. Mm. So the process of making effective change through the curriculum mm. is what matters most. Mm. And this is done by teachers mm. in school set settings. So you are right if you say pedagogy. Okay. So it, the curricular reform will remain book work, mm. paperwork until. And the one on literacy issues is the emergence of so many literacies. In other words, literacy is no longer of a question of elementary reading and writing mm. for adults. Mm. It's a question of continuous improvement of yourself okay. and these days there is this question of digital literacy mm. uh, if you if you if you fail to develop there you are gone it's just to say that literacy is not just one literacy mm. but several 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 literacies literacy. okay. and the third last section talks about um, let me see talks about higher education mm. yes we are saying one Higher education in Africa cannot be as high as it should be if basic education is not as solid okay. as it should be. Mm. So uh, there is a linkage. Yeah, you have to lay the foundation first. Okay. And most importantly, higher education has to have a triple mission okay. of one, generating knowledge, which they call research. Mm. Two, transmitting knowledge, which we call teaching, and then transferring knowledge which we call responsive social invol uh, involvement. Okay. And I'm saying if higher education does not involve itself in societal change, mm. does not work in what I now call the social laboratory, yeah. meaning the world out there, mm -hmm. it is no use. Mm. So in other words, the message is that higher education should seek relevance in Africa yeah. okay. to be useful. Okay. Mm. okay, Prof, now let's come to one aspect of your life. From your rich CV, you have traveled widely. Where else have you not been to well, that you, you, you want to go? I would like to work. Widely. Well, you see, I've not only traveled, I have worked you have in worked. these countries yeah. and I've learned. Okay. Uh -huh. And I've probably made some influence and made some contacts. Okay. Well, one place I would have liked to work in is uh, China. China. Mm for several reasons. Okay. One is that China is an old civilization. Yeah. Uh, and we cannot dismiss it. Mm. And if you're coming from Africa, whose civilization is older than any old one, mm. I think it pays together. Okay. The second is that the Chinese are making waves. Can we, coming from a developed developed country, see what they've used to make waves mm. and see what we could learn from mm. that? Mm. Mm. Okay. And in your travels, you've received several awards. I recall in your CV that there is an award from um, Senegal. Can you just tell us a little bit about that award? Is it a national award or is it an institutional award? It is a very national one, awarded by the president, signed by the president. Of Senegal? Of Senegal, President Abdi Juf. Oh. And it's called, if you translate in English, into English, Commander of the National Order of the Lion. Commander of the National Order of the Lion. Commander of the Lord National du Lion. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. The lion is the symbol of Africa, of yeah. uh, Senegal. You know, mm. and when they sing Genje, 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 they are talking lion, lion, mm. lion. Mm. Uh, it's a national one and it's mm. a high one. Mm -hmm. uh, I think um, in Breda, the office was located in Senegal, right. but we were serving the whole of Africa. And I thought, for Senegal to benefit from this, it's not, it wasn't sufficient to have the office in Senegal. Mm -hmm. I, within the office, created a special section for Senegal. For the country-specific yes. programs, okay. And we got involved in whatever they were doing. 
in the areas of uh, competence of UNESCO, as they were called, education, science, uh, human sciences, culture, and communication. And of course, it also involved mobilizing Senegalese talents. Mm -hmm. And Sen Senegalese are really high mm -hmm. when it comes to education, culture, science. Mm -hmm. And I think it was in appreciation of this okay. that towards the end of my stay, uh, Minister Andre Sanko recommended me to the presidency okay. where I was received and conferred with this honor. You also had honors from ADIA, yes. that's the Association for the Development of Education in Africa. And then, I don't know, several other honors. Did you ever receive any national honor in Nigeria? <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's go back to Adea. You remember that Adea actually started after the famous John Chen Conference on Education for All. Yes. So it was something serviced by UNESCO. Okay. And since I was in charge of education in Africa, I was closely. In fact, I was nominated to be the first executive secretary of Adea. Hmm. The lack of attraction was that it was the same level of director in the UN system. Oh, okay. And that was the time I was being programmed to be director for Breda. And okay. whether I was in, at anywhere, I would be working with Adea. That okay. was the reason I did not okay. accept. And after I left office, I was still an Adea-oriented person. Okay. And one of these days, these days I receive all sorts of announcements. Mm. Many I don't read, I just forward to, to younger people. I forwarded this the announcement without looking at it. And then somebody from Kenya called me and said he was nominating me. And before I knew it, I was asked to fill forms wow. who had what I had done and so on. Mm. And one day I was traveling between Ibadan and Lagos, I got a phone call from a lady who said her father had even worked with Breda with me. Mm. And was with, said, you got category A. I had to be explaining what it was. And I was so busy, I couldn't even go to France for the award. Oh, no. Uh, so I asked uh, Madam, um, the Nigerian ambassador to UNESCO yeah. to represent me, yeah, and I'm grateful for it. Mm. And in subsequent years, I've had to recommend people, including my own Institute of Education in Nevada, mm. Mm. and they've, they've, got, they've got this award. Mm. Uh, and then, then the national awards, how many have you received? Zero. I've Prof, got, come again. Yes, I've got from professional organizations. Hmm? I am a fellow of the Nigerian Curriculum Organization, mm. for which I was even a founding mm. publicity secretary. Mm. I'm a fellow of the Nigerian Academy of Education. I was also a founding member. I'm a fellow of the Nigerian Institute of Management. Yes. I got involved with them. Within two years, I was made a fellow. Uh, but when it, uh, of course, Ibadan University also made me an emeritus in 2014. Yes. Under normal circumstances, I had left early. I was 47 when I left. Okay. Uh -huh. But I think I've been working on education since I left. Mm. And I think uh, when Ibadan, I was recommended by the Institute of Education, my papers got there, and the next thing I heard was that. I've been appointed, and it's called Professor for Life. Professor for it's, Life. It's not anybody who is retired who is called emeritus. Yes. Uh -huh. The person has to merit it by continuing to be relevant and okay. so on. And I think as a passion, I've continued to be relevant. Mm. So if you say national, mm. yes, but if it's national as government and whatever, zero. Viewers, I'm talking to Professor Pai Ubanya. And this is Impact Stories on AE TV. Please stay tuned in. We are going for a short break.
I have been talking to Professor Pai Ubanya on his life as an academic in Africa. And I'm privileged once again to have with me Dr. Charlotte Ubanya, who is the lovely wife of my professor, Pai Ubanya. Auntie Charlotte, you've been married to Professor Ubanya for 50 years. 51 years. 51 precisely, years. Yes. Wow. Yes. How, how is it like to be married to a man who never stays at home, always trotting around the globe, educationeering? Well, he's a responsible man. Okay. When he's not at home, he makes sure he gets in touch with us all the time, mm. with me and the children. Okay. And uh, anytime he comes home, it's a honeymoon. Hmm. When and he's at home, it's a honeymoon. When he's at home, it's a honeymoon. And when he's going for longer periods, do you go with him? Occasionally, yes. Occasionally, Occasionally you go yes. with him. If I don't go, it's because I'm too busy to, I'm working. Yes, I'm, you are working. Uh, when I'm on leave and it coincides with when he's out, yes. Oh, you go he, with he, him. He will. He always offers to take me. Hmm. No. Professor Banya has so many publications to his name. He hardly sleeps because at 3 a.m., Professor Obanya is still writing and sending mails. What contributions do you make towards his writing skills and abilities? He has these publications, you know. How do you cope? Fortunately, I read education too. Okay. And. Uh, we happen to have been in the same class at the university. Wow. We entered the same year mm. and we read the same course. Okay. So I understand most of the things he's writing. Although he knows much more because he's gone further, he's a mm. professor. Okay. I can't compare my knowledge with his. Mm. But then when he writes, most of the time I glance through. Okay. The little I can uh, contribute, I do. Mm. And he's a humble man to the core. Wow. He will listen. Mm. But the main ideas are his. Okay. Maybe I read, what do I contribute? Typographical errors. Okay. Oh, they left out this, they left out that, mm. that's all. Mm. But he's a wonderful man. He's mm. a gifted person. Mm. So I, and I realized that from the first day we met, mm. yes. Mm. So are, are you urging him on to be writing for his grandchildren? He's always writing, you know, on thematic uh, issues. But what about fables for the grandchildren? Well, you see, the way he influences the grandchildren, they themselves are becoming writers. Mm. Mm. Because he keeps telling them, and the children too, when you have an idea, put it, put it down, put it and revise later. Mm. Write and then revise. And they all, they write, they, they do write. Mm. And um, mm. he encourages them. Mm. Uh, anybody who passes through this home, our home, will testify to the fact that they have to progress. They have no choice. Mm. They are, educationally, they have no choice. Okay. Yes. How many children do you have? I have three. You have three children? Two, two women and one man. Okay. Because they are all married. Okay. Uh -huh. All right. And how many grandchildren? Eight. Okay. So what are your favorite times when you meet the, the family? Well, is it during uh, occasions, vacations, or weddings, or birthdays? Uh, at times, you know, when you have a family and the family is neatly closed, you know, yes. the children, as I have two of them overseas, one in Lagos. Mm -hmm. The one in Lagos cannot do without coming here at least once in the month oh, yeah. uh, with my grandchildren. Mm. Then, we have the ones there, they come once in a while, like uh, bad days if we celebrate, mm -hmm. whichever one we want to celebrate, they come. Mm -hmm. 
and there is happy reunion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, apart from the biological children, I know a lot of people might have passed through this, this house, for this home, as children. Yeah. Do you keep track of those whom you have of really course, of course, taken of care course. of? And there are so many, myriads. There are so many. Yeah. I, when I start, one day, I just sat down, thinking, oh, I have three children. In fact, my children never knew they were three. Really? Because the house was always full. Hmm. And then, after some time, they started noticing that these people are... Uh, uh, my young boy, Mommy, you mean we're only three? <laughs> <laughs> I said, hmm. you, you're not the mother of this? Hmm. You're not the mother of this? Hmm. You're not the mother of... I said, no. But, you know, because they all grew up as brothers and sisters. Yes. They call those other ones sister, brother. They didn't even, even the house help. They thought was part of uh, yeah, yeah, their, the family, their blood, and they, because it's auntie, mm. sister, all that. But uh, well, we thank God. Yeah, we thank I God. personally, I thank God, and I'm mm. sure my husband is proud today. Yes, uh, it is not wealth. I have even been adopted. Uh, yes, right now. Yes. Yes, right <laughs> now. <laughs> you, are you are adding to the numbers. To come to the numbers. Yes. Thank God. Well, we, we are so grateful yeah. and we wish God's blessing to you and our Papa Emeritus yeah. Professor Pai Ubana, Thank you. Who, who is an international icon. Yes. Educationeering everywhere. Yes. And he's still very strong. Yes. And he says that behind that pillar, yes. or behind his strength, yes. is the pillar, yes. which is you. Now, and let me tell you one thing. Okay. Professor Pai Ubana is a very, very kind and humble person. Okay. I tell you in our class, when we came in, he had already learned shorthand. So he took his lectures almost verbatim. Mm. Then he would give it to us, people like us, and we co copy and fill the gap. Okay. Yet, he the most brilliant mm. of us all. Mm. He always got A's in yes. every, yeah. mm. every essay. Subject. Every essay. Mm. Teaching practice, it's distinction. Mm. And because we were coming up together, yeah. you know, he's one year older. Mm. I'll be 80 next year, he's 80, 80 this year. So you can see if we've been together for 51 years, ah, then... Mm. He must be a very good man. Mm. And I think he thinks that I'm good too. You are extremely <laughs> good. You are extremely good. Perfect match. Thank you. So how are we celebrating the 80th birthday? Is there a series of programs that we need to follow? Yes, uh, but most of it by the university communities and all that. Mm. So, but mm. we are having something here on the 29th. Okay. So and viewers, uh, I thank you for at least this interview. I, I say all of you should please pray for him as he goes and comes. That's the only thing I can give him is to pay. each time he goes, I pray mm. for his safety. And as God has given him this, may he continue to work hard and serve humanity because that's what he's doing. And helping people to educate themselves. Mm. So I, I, I am happy you came and I thank you very, very much. I, you see, I cannot be singing my own praise. I can't mm. do that. I can only sing his mm. own. Mm. But uh, we are happy. We are a very happy family. Yes. We are not rich, but we are not poor because that would make, make me sin. Mm. Uh -huh. I'm not poor because I can eat. Yes. Uh -huh. mm. But uh, these are emotional ways. Yes. Mm. We don't. We don't believe in acquisition of mass wealth. wealth. Mass wealth. Yes. No. Both of us, we happen mm. to have the same ideologies mm. about life, mm. and uh, believing that as long as you live, when God gives you, and you have the chance to give, please give. Mm. 
Thank you very much, Mama Charlotte. Thank you for confirming and affirming the fact that we have somebody who is teaching teachers how to teach. Yes. And that person is Emeritus Professor. And he's married to a teacher. Ubanya, who is I'm also a, married to a teacher. I'm a retired school principal. A retired school principal. Of old. Of principal old. of that time. Okay. <laughs> so thank you very much, Mama Charlotte. Thank God you. bless you and thank God bless you. your home. And God bless you too. Amen. God bless all of you okay. for coming. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are you an institution or individual? Do you intend to organize a memorable event to be archived for future reference? Then look no further than AAU Studios because it's your best bet. With our spacious studio and state-of-the-art media equipment such as 4K Panasonic video cameras, Kinoflow lights, assorted microphones, live streaming machines and others, you are sure to get the best of production. Visit us at Trinity Avenue, East Legon, adjacent the National Accreditation Board or contact the AAU studio via the following addresses. Info at aau.org, aautv at aau.org, ransford at aau.org. Alternatively, you can call us on 0244-185-998 or 0244-6 Three, three, Welcome back viewers to Impact Stories on AAU TV. You are following us on our social media handles and on our dedicated website tv.aau.org. I'm interviewing Professor Pai Ubanya here at Ibadan in Nigeria and we have spoken widely about his life story, his academic and professional life. Now it is the turn to talk about your social life. Mm -hmm. Prof, you are well sought after by so many people, so many organizations, and you are almost everywhere. How do you cope with this uh, kind of demanding life and you are still active and strong? Well, it's not demanding. <laughs> huh? First of all, uh, let me say something about my traveling. Okay. I started traveling, particularly around Africa in 1974, as secretary of the African Curriculum Organization. It was in fact formed in Ghana after a workshop in Jimpa. Okay. And Mr. M. F. Menka, director then of Ghana Education Service, was our everything. I wasn't part of the meeting that started it, mm. but my boss, Professor Yoleye, became chairman because they wanted the activities attached to a university. Mm. And the main mandate was to train, to professionalize the task of curriculum development. Okay. Because people were sometimes just moved from the ministry to recover. So they needed a secretary whose job would be to push all this training forward. Mm. And I was selected for three reasons. One, I was still young. They said young and dynamic, 76, okay. 74. Two, I speak French. Three, you will accept not to be paid mm. because they had no money. <laughs> okay. And for 10 years, I ran around Africa and got to know Africa. And I don't mean staying in hotels, working with people mm. and enjoying their hospitality mm. and becoming an adapted child of every community. Africans are wonderful. But I keep saying I was not paid. I was compensated. Mm. At the same time, as a, somebody has some passion for education, for teaching, I'd always argued, teachers' unions, please argue salaries. I am more interested in the knowledge package of the teacher, so that when I sit with government, they are talking continuous assessment, I to talk continuous assessment. That brought me in contact with Nigerian Union of Teachers first, mm -hmm. then all Africa Association of Teachers, whose secretary was Tom Bediak of Ghana, okay. and later World Confederation of Teachers of the Organization of Teaching Profession. And in fact, when the world body was to get in touch with me, they came through Bediako and Dr. Itoto, who was an activity, but who happened to have been my students. And what were they asking? To persuade me to come to Cameroon to give a keynote address. They had no money for, key, for honorarium. Okay. My reply was that I didn't need any honorarium. Mm. So you are but selfless. Ju ju just like the, my first appearance in Breda, it was like you are doing... Um, a naming ceremony for a baby, you became known. And from then, people started looking for you. 
But in subsequent years, the same people for whom, from whom you didn't accept money, yes. they came the same people who were paying you. And in the case <laughs> of the teachers, they, they persuaded me to work with them. Mm. I wasn't looking for a job. I yeah. left the teachers feeding to me. Mm. Again, for UNESCO too, I was doing what you might call selfless. Mm. It was in East Berlin, and it was Second International Conference on Technical Vocational Education. Mm. <laughs> the report was written before the event, and there was a so-called rapporteur. But each time a point was raised, I made an additional point, and mm. that thing was revised. <laughs> While enjoying myself in a sauna, mm -hmm. uh, a Japanese in UNESCO, now Professor Chiba, came to me, Pai, why don't you want to work with UNESCO? Mm. And so when a vacancy arose and I applied, the man in Dakar already liked me. Okay. Those in Paris had met me. Mm -hmm. So when I was appointed, I was told there was no need. Need for interview? No, not, no there, was no, there was no need for briefing. Oh. I should come across and hold a meeting with the education sector and go straight to Dakar. Mm. And oh. I got to Dakar, my man just liked me. Everything Pi will do it. Mm. So, mm. And I learned as quickly as I could. So now you, you, you appear to be extremely busy writing, giving keynote addresses, and you are everywhere. How do you cope with I social not, life? I'm not even busy. In those days I was talking about, I traveled 250 days a year. You traveled 250 days only. a year? Only. And these days I travel... Out of 365? I, yes. These days I travel only 120. So my family was used to saying, Daddy, where are you going again? And does Mama go with you? Uh, well, wh where possible. Okay. Where he thinks she can gain something. Mm. The children and Mama started going to Togo with me annually from 1980. Mm when I was sought after to be a research person there. When I was invited to the job in Switzerland, mm. I came with the family for the first six weeks and they went back. Mm. And uh, Madam has been with me to so many other places, mm. including living in Sweden mm. and living in Switzerland. How long mm. have you been married? Uh, only 51 years. You've been married for 51 years? Yes, January 19, 1968. That was yesterday, not too long ago. Mm. 51 years? Only. Uh, so what I'm saying is that um, I'm able to cope. I don't see any challenge. First, I do what I believe in. Secondly, these days you have the ICT mm. that has sort of simplified things. Okay. And third, I plan my own program. If you're inviting me, we agree whether I will be free or not free. Mm. But the process of education hearing is always there. I have an office in the university. Mm. When I'm there, the door is open, All right. and I'll have over 20 young people sitting with me to address their own problems. But Lecturers will come with me, I will knock on their doors and discuss with them. I find that I carry all this in my slang. I come back home, I watch television, I read the day's newspapers, I eat, uh, I smoke Campari, <laughs> uh, I play the role of a house husband walk in the garden here, do all sorts of things, attend to my relations and friends. Huh? You mean you have leisure? Of course. Then if, I, if at 10 p.m. I go to the study for three hours, so when you get a mail from me at one o'clock, you think I've been in the mail since... So, so, so when day. is the leisure time? All this other time of the day, when I'm at home, I've been at home since morning. If you were here in the morning, I was the one who scrubbed all this. It is leisure. It is pleasure as well. Hmm. Do you keep count of people you are mentoring? Well, no, because mentoring is not a strictly formal process. Hmm? If you parked your car outside there, and I come in and say, oh, how are you? And you start talking to me, you say, oh, the country is hard. I will not even know your name. We discuss, I tell you stories, you laugh. Hmm. Then we exchange, you go. That little story may have impacted on your life. Hmm. When I see you next, I won't even remember who you are. So I can't keep count, but when it comes to strictly academic counseling, mm. well, part of my luck has been that uh, even as the youngest lecturer in the park, others will come to me to say, Oga, see my problem. Mm. Perhaps something, there's something in me that says he, he will listen. But what I know is that you'll be frowning when you come to me. When you leave me, you'll be laughing. And laughter is good medicine. Mm. 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 So I have lost count. Okay. Uh, if I say my young days in Ibadan University, 
they were usually uh, not two young people when we started the one year masters. Okay. You know, a busy man or woman coming to you, mm. in spite of these three children, I want to register. Mm. And you encourage her to register. The next one comes to you, I'm having problems with my wife, how do I cope? Oh, mm. you can cope. Oh, my, I'm now a principal of my school, how do I cope? I say, look, you have more time than you think you have. All the time you spend gossiping can be spent on this. Oh, I'm supposed to submit this paper tomorrow. I say, okay, in my own case, yesterday was a deadline. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but with that encouragement, you laugh mm -hmm. and you continue. And then when a new lecturer gets into the faculty, I always went to such a person okay. to say, how do you rise? Mm -hmm. And when I was lucky to be invited to the Dean of Education in Lagos State University, almost everybody around me went there. Mm. All of them, one who has distinguished so much is Professor Okebukola. Okay. Mm -hmm. I didn't know him, he, didn't, he knew me and thought I, was, I had two heads, but was asked to wait for me by the staircase. As soon as I held his hand, it started. Wow. He came for an interview without even applying. And in my days in UNESCO, UNESCO doesn't do the work itself. UNESCO doesn't give money. UNESCO may not have or gets academics wherever they are. So I wanted Okebukola into something. I couldn't, I didn't push because there was an under Nigerian. Mm. So I, but when I got all the Francophone countries to come to Nigeria to learn about integrated science, he walked in mm. and became the darling of the organizer. Okay. From then on, he walks into every other thing mm -hmm. and is always a darling. And it has happened whether they come from Burkina Faso or come from Madagascar. Uh, when I went to, okay, when Ethiopia finished its independent, uh, fought its war, they wanted an education sector development program. Okay. UNESCO said they were offering not money but the brain and time of me. So I found myself going 10 times in two years. Of course, each time I met good people, yeah. their names entered something. Mm. Uh -huh. Even those who recommended me for the award of mentor, yes. uh -huh. I did <laughs> not. And so many people, somebody is doing a book of tributes in my honor. It's over a hundred people who say they are, my, they are mentors. Well, some, I didn't know what I did, but mm. you see, there is a non-formal, informal type of mentoring mm. that you have, you think you have a problem. Mm. You can talk to a senior person yeah. Who, who dismisses the problem and gives you encouragement. There's also the formal one where you sit together, this is how to write a book, this is how to do a thesis. Mm. But I must say that one third of my time is still spent on that. Mm. If I open my computer at 10 o'clock, there'll be at least 10 emails asking for reference letter to mm. do something. Mm. 10 emails saying, I've written a book, what do you think? 10 emails saying, oh, that one you read before, can you write a forward? Mm. before I go to the real things. So, and I saw, I call it the duty I owe to the younger mm. generation. Mm. Mm. Prof, this month you are celebrating your 80th birthday. You mean so? Yes. I've forgotten. And you are strong, active, agile, whatever. What is the word of advice to the teaming people who are looking up to you as their mentor? And that will be our final word. One is that I think I've been lucky and God has been in charge. Mm. Uh, um, I've had health challenges too. But fortunately, uh, I probably went to the right places and they're uh, over. Mm. But uh, strict, uh, uh, beyond that, I just wake up in the morning and do my thing. Mm. And whatever the problem, I'm always smiling, saying that uh, the only problem in the world is that there is no, no problem. problem. Mm -hmm. Mm. And that's the advice I will to people. Do what you enjoy doing. Don't, mm. do, don't play football because footballers are making money. Two, don't dwell on the immediate how much money I'm going to get now. Mm. Think of the long term and think of things that money cannot buy. Like I said, I wasn't paid, mm. but I was compensated. And three, be yourself. Mm. Uh, the world is full of distractions. Okay. Do what you believe in and do it well. And above everything else, be a guardian is like us, believe in God. Hallelujah. Unfortunately, viewers, this is where I have to end this very exciting interview with Emeritus Professor Pai Obanya, who keeps saying that the only problem in the world is that there is no, no problem. problem and he has other wise sayings. I think you have left 
some of the scenes that you've been telling me. Work your work. Work your work. Yes. yes. So many scenes that Professor Banya tells us. But what interests me most of all his scenes is when he says that a good conversation yeah. never ends. Yes. yes. Unfortunately, we need to end this segment of Pai Obanya's life. Stay tuned in for other programs on AETV. Until next time, when I come your way again, I have been your host, Ransom Beckwin. Take care and bye. <laughs>